I've got a fun one this time. This time we're going to do one of my favorite QED problems, and also one of the very first ones that I ever did correctly when I was first learning this. It's one that's got a special place in my heart, and it is calculating the tree-level differential scattering cross-section for a process consisting of an electron and a positron annihilating to yield an off-shell photon, which then decays into a pair consisting of a muon and an anti-muon. So it's muon pair production by electron pair annihilation. And it's a famous scattering cross-section, it's a famous result from QED, and it's a really fun one to derive, it's not too horrible a calculation, and it's a very beautiful result. And because it was one of the first ones I ever did right myself, it's really something I love and am very happy to share with you. So, the basic process consists of using the Feynman rules to write out the Feynman amplitude, taking the right averaged square of it, and then sticking it in the scattering cross-section formula, which we processed down a little bit beforehand. And then we simplify by picking a particular parameterization for the momenta. Specifically, we take the center of mass frame in this case. And then it's a bunch of algebra, and we get this really beautiful, exciting result out of it, and it's super fun. And I'm always very excited when I get to look at this problem and talk about it. And I don't know why I didn't do a YouTube video sooner on it. But here it is now. Consider subscribing. Now for the math section. So I've written out the Feynman rules that are required for calculating this process and labeled them. We have the labels in the left column and then the Feynman rules corresponding to those labels in the right column. I've also labeled the momenta of the various particles involved. Here we have the Feynman diagram for the tree-level process that we're calculating the cross-section for here. We've got a positron and an electron annihilating, and presumably they have a lot of energy because they can create a pair of much more massive particles, it's the muon and the anti-muon and the positron-electron annihilation is basically just the way of making an energetic off-shell photon that can then decay that way. We're calculating the differential scattering cross-section. For two incoming fermions and some number of outgoing fermions, the differential scattering cross-section general formula is right here. Now if we specialize that to the problem we're studying, we have this value for that cross-section where we plug in the muon and electron masses and look up the momentum labels and then plug in the corresponding names. The desired cross-section is with respect to the solid angle of one of the outgoing muon type particles, so the muon or the anti-muon. Thus, four of the six integration variables must be integrated out. First, integrating out this volume differential is trivially easy because of the delta function, which just enforces momentum conservation. So after the integration, we have this value, and then, of course, this momentum conservation relation. And we've got one delta function left, and we still need to perform one more integration. I chose to integrate out the anti-muon momentum and leave the cross-section with respect to the solid angle differential of the outgoing muon. So we need to integrate over the magnitude of the momentum of the muon here to leave the muon solid angle differential behind. Now these energies here are going to be some function of the magnitude of the momentum of the muon here. So uh, what we need to do is then work out what those functions are and transform the delta function and then we'll be free to do this integration and we'll get the differential scattering cross-section general formula in terms of the square of the Feynman amplitude with respect to the solid angle differential of the outgoing muon. So we know obviously E3 is going to have this value, and we also know that E4 will have this value, but P4 magnitude should be the same as P3 because this is going to be done in the center of mass frame. So the incoming positron and electron momenta will be the same and necessarily for momentum conservation reasons P4 and P3 will have the same magnitude. So then we have this formula here. So then we can transform the delta function and get it into a form that facilitates the integration where F prime of P3 magnitude is the derivative of the F function and P3 
magnitude naught is the root of the f function, or the actual value of p3 vector magnitude as fixed by the delta function, which is enforcing this energy conservation. Basically, it does just make this equality the case. Relabeling the actual momentum p3 naught with the symbol previously used for the integration variable to make things simpler, and continuing the calculation. The integration over the magnitude of the momentum gives us this result, where this f prime via direct calculation simply works out to have this value. So then we ultimately arrive at this result here, which can be simplified. And then we can use the energy conservation relation that the delta function imposed to manipulate it a little bit. And we finally get this result here. Now, if we specialize to the center of mass frame more completely, we already used the center of mass frame to arrive at the fact that P4 magnitude is equal to P3 magnitude there, but we didn't use the fact that we're specializing to the center of mass frame to simplify it any further. We can use it to simplify things quite a bit more, and doing that ultimately gives us this result. So now it's time to use the Feynman rules given above to write out the actual Feynman amplitude for the Feynman diagram also given at the beginning. Going back up, this is the Feynman diagram that we're looking at for this tree level process and this is the set of Feynman rules we're using. The Feynman amplitude according to that Feynman diagram and those Feynman rules looks like this. Simplifying it gives this. So now we need to take a particular averaged modulus squared of that amplitude. Of course, in this modulus squared, we have a complex conjugate on one of the factors, which reverses the order of the matrix factors in that particular factor of the Feynman amplitude here. Now we're summing over the final spins, because this is the unpolarized cross-section, and we need to sum over all the possible output spins. And then we're averaging over the initial spins, because this is the unpolarized cross-section, and we need to take into account that they may come in with random probability with either possible spin. The easiest way to evaluate what this spin-summed expression actually is is to recognize it's a factor of two scalar quantities, and we can stick traces in there without changing anything, and then use the cyclic property of the trace in these two identities to re-express these traces in a form that's easy to evaluate. Then all we need to do is actually evaluate these traces with gamma matrix identities. It's kind of long-winded, and it looks really complicated, but it really is just algebra and application of gamma matrix identities, which I give here, all the required ones. So I go through each algebra step, and ultimately we get this result for the first trace factor. And then a similar calculation yields a similar result for the second trace factor, and then we need to take the contracted product of those to get the value for this averaged squared Feynman amplitude. So plugging the values in that we just calculated for these two traces, and then simplifying ultimately gives this result. So now we've got, in terms of dot products of momentum vectors, a value for this averaged squared amplitude. So now we can remember that we're in the center of mass frame and pick a convenient parameterization for the momentum vectors based on that fact. And then with that, we can start evaluating all these dot products and then plugging them in. And this is my favorite part of any of the scattering cross-section calculations because it's where the formula starts to look really pretty when you get the parameterization of the momentum in. So plugging that into this average squared amplitude and then simplifying it, we finally get this gorgeous simplified result down here. And then we can plug that into the center of mass differential scattering cross-section with respect to the solid angle of the outgoing muon. And doing that and simplifying a little bit further, re remembering that we can write values for these quantities now in terms of the parameterization we selected. And we ultimately get all the way down here to this really pretty gorgeous result. This is one of the first calculations in QED that I ever did correctly when I was learning the subject, so I have a lot of happy memories associated with this. It's a really fun formula. I absolutely love it. Okay, so now you've seen all the technical details associated with deriving that formula. You've seen the beautiful math. You've seen the beautiful formula itself. So, 
I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope this helped you love quantum electrodynamics too. And if you liked it, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. My channel could use that.